Just tell the truth about yourself. All narrative, all fiction is actually an autobiography. You're writing about the world that you see, your perceptions, your take. And so when you create a character, just make him as human as you are. I'd like to welcome to the show Steve Kaplan, man. Thank you so much for jumping on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you, man. I've been I've been wanting to get you on the show for a long time, and as you've like I said earlier off 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 air, it's like I've seen your work fly through my feed so many times, and it's just like I got to reach out to Steve one of these days. I got to reach out to Steve one of these days. It's just everything got caught up, but I finally have you here to talk comedy. We're both excited. <laughs> Good. So you have a, uh, a a long and illustrious career in uh, in the business. How did you get started in the business? Um, I started out as a um, as a bad actor or <laughs> mediocre actor, okay, uh, and and a uh, and a kind of a frustrated comic. Uh, I was I was not very good as a comic. Places asked me never to come back, like <laughs> not even as a customer. Uh, and um, and I was uh, I I had two friends who were actors, and I had started doing some directing, and they. Uh, they said, well, you know, we can't get, uh, we want to control our own career. So uh, we want to start a theater company in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And I said, great, let me think about it for a second. So I came back to a meeting with them and I said, let's do something that no one else is doing. Everybody else does, you know, serious theater and they do productions of Chekhov, uh, internal necks and, uh, and uh, expressionistic abstract plays. And I said, let's, let's be different. Let's do comedy. Let's be a theater company that's devoted only to comedy. Okay. And, um, and they thought about it for a second, and they, they realized that it, uh, at the time in New York, it, it kind of filled a niche that no one else was filling. So we started this, uh, this theater company. We called it Manhattan Punchline. Uh, it wasn't a comedy club. It, we did plays, we did, uh, but we did stand-up nights, we did improv, and a lot of great people came out of it. Um, uh, uh, we had, uh, David Crane who went on to do a little thing called friends yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, Oliver Platt who's a great actor. And, um, uh, uh, we had people who later went on, uh, like Steve Scrovan and, and, uh, David Fury, they later went on to become executive producers in television. Um, uh, Michael Patrick King, who uh, did Sex in the City and Two Broke Girls, he was the he was in our improv group. Uh, so a lot of great people came out of it. And as as a young man, in the arrogance of youth, I thought I knew everything there was to know about comedy. Of course, uh, I was I was fascinated by comedy as a kid. Um, uh, I I watched all the old uh, uh, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope. Road movies, um, St Laurel and Hardy, uh, you know Abbott and Costello. I thought I knew everything there was to know about comedy, but after producing and directing for a couple of years, I thought to myself, okay, I don't know everything, but I know it's <laughs> not funny. God damn it! Uh, and shortly thereafter, I thought to myself, how the frick does this stuff work? Mm -hmm. Why is something funny on a Thursday no longer funny on a Sunday? Interesting. Why is why is a, a, a script sometimes the funniest the first time you get some actors around a table to read it? And after that, as when you're working on it, the more you work on it, the more you rehearse it, the less funny it becomes. So I, uh, so what was going on? So I started doing uh, experiments. I started – I was teaching an improv class to actors and I started creating and designing improv games and exercises to try to understand what comedy is, why it works – what's happening when it doesn't work and how can you fix it? And, and out of that, um, 25 year exploration, uh, uh, came this book, uh, the hidden tools of comedy. Um, and, uh, I, I did that because when I came to Los Angeles, uh, a, a guy who had been working with Robert McKay. Now, mm -hmm. Sure. Of you, course. Yeah. You know, right. Story. Of course. Yeah. And, yeah. Story. And he said to me, he said, you know, you could do for comedy what Robert McKee does for story. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Because up to then, I had just been a theater director. I had worked with actors. I had taught acting uh, and improv. And so then I started to work with writers and, and do workshops for writers. And that kind of uh, snowballed. And, and pretty soon, I was being flown out to Singapore 
to London, to New York, to uh, to Australia, and uh, and pretty soon I'm traveling around the world and uh, and doing comedy. And it all came out of the fact uh, that I was this frustrated performer uh, who tried to get his class to laugh unsuccessfully. <laughs> I, I, I was, you know, most people are class clowns. I was a failed class clown. Okay. And, <laughs> well, you know, uh, and look, no, 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 it's interesting that you say that because I, I, you know, I find it that there are people who are innately funny, like they could just, you throw them in front of a room and they could just make the crowd laugh. And then there's people who can write funny, but you throw them in front of a crowd, they just, they, they just won't be able to do it. And and sometimes you and then sometimes you get the magic of both. You get someone who's right. an amazing writer and an amazing performer. Um, but it sounds like you were more of the writing style as opposed. No, to No, actually, performing. actually, I was I was more of the if you get me in a room um, at a party, uh, yeah. put a couple of drinks in me, maybe uh, <laughs> you know, maybe a cigarette or two, you know, um, and and I can be pretty funny. But but it was. Uh, getting up in front of uh, strangers and mm. and writing material. So what I found was my my skill or or my uh, my gift was was not in creating material, uh, but in working on other people's material. And that's that that's why I was a good director. And I became a very and I am a very uh, uh, accomplished uh, story analyst and story consultant. So I do a lot of script consulting uh, for writers and um, and and producers and production companies you know what I uh, when I, when when analyzing comedy because I'm, I'm I love comedies I've, I've been I've followed comedies on like I, I and you know even every every part of the kind of work I do as a director or as a writer I always have some sort of comedic element into it it's just it's in, in, innate in me um, and I've been uh, fortunate or unfortunate to know many stand-up comics in my lifetime. <laughs> And worked with many stand-up comics over the years, um, which are generally the saddest people. <laughs> they are, they are, they are dark, broken, broken people. Uh, Ray Romano once said that if he had been hugged once as a child, he'd be an accountant. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and they're you know they're filling uh, they're you know even more than than actors. Uh, comics are trying to fill uh, in. Uh, an unfillable hole that can never be, mm -hmm. never be completed. Um, doesn't doesn't mean that every uh, comic uh, is is depressed or has to be depressed. No. Uh, but um, well adjusted uh, people do not go into stand up comedy. <laughs> Amen, sir. Amen. Um, so, no, what I, what I find funny is, like, growing up in the, you know, I'm an 80s kid, uh, and, and I, you know, a lot of the comedies from the 80s, and even from the 70s, the Mel Brooks stuff, uh, Spaceballs, Blazing Saddles, yeah. Silent Movie, um, History of the World, some of that stuff still stays, like Young Frankenstein, you can watch Young Frankenstein today, yes. and it holds, Young, it holds. Young Frankenstein uh, holds up... Um, uh, High anxiety does not. Correct. Yeah, there's certain there's certain things that do. So, in your opinion, why? And, and I think the difference is, uh, Young Frankenstein, even though it's full of gags, mm -hmm. is about a, is a story. Yes. About a guy mm -hmm. uh, trying to create uh, a, a relationship and and trying to figure out his place in the world. Whereas high anxiety is simply a series of parodies on Hitchcock. Right. With uh, with a disposable story that you that you you know if you think about it you can't really believe in it you don't really believe in the relationship right. so to me comedy that that sustains and that that uh, that holds up over time even if it's as silly as airplane oh, is God, always so a, good. is always about characters in crisis uh, as opposed to scary movie four which has <laughs> which has as many gags per minute as airplane does right. but you don't care about those characters you're you're they never ask you to take them seriously they never ask you to care about them to empathize with them I, so that's to me that's the big difference Air, airplane is 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 uh, it's on my top top 10 comedies of all time i mean it's just it's a brilliant thing and those kind of films though they they do hold over time it's like you watch even uh some like it hot you watch some like oh, it hot brilliant. 
That's and, brilliant. And that thing is like, it's like a Swiss, a Swiss clock. It is just hitting boom and a boom and a boom. And it's, and it holds. And how old is that? That was from the 50s? Uh, it's in the 50s, yeah. Yeah, so that, I mean, that movie is over half a, you know, a decade, oh, not decade, a half a century old. And, exactly. And it still holds. Hey, 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 don't be ageist. Hey, 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 hey. You okay, know what I mean. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, it's... Okay. No, 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 but it's still, no, but like, you know, but it's a lot 50 of 50 years young, obviously, obviously, yeah. but, but the, there's a lot of things that even from the nineties don't hold. Um, and from the oh. t- in early two thousands that were pot might've made a noise when it came out, but you go back and watch it now. You're just like, uh, like Borat, which I still find, I couldn't believe Borat was made. I went back and watched it a little bit. It does. I mean, I know all the jokes coming, so it doesn't hold as much as it did when it first came out. Um, yeah. You know, when it did in that kind of comedy, but it was very. It's just very interesting what makes things hold and what doesn't make. You know, and and you're saying it's more story I, I and character. It, it's character. Uh, it's it's a it's the great combination of character, premise, and theme. Mm-hmm. So that so that even something as silly as Airplane again mm-hmm. has all those three things, whereas um, you know uh, Deuce Bigelow, American Gigolo does not. <laughs> right. uh, for me, uh, when when people ask me what's my favorite comedy, uh, I, I I have many favorites. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like asking what's your favorite kid. But for me, one of my favorite comedies of all time is Groundhog Day because oh, I think so it's brilliant. it's an amazing combination of of comedy you know just pure laughs uh great performance by andy mcdowell and and bill murray but it's also about about something it's about what do you do with if you had a a a million lifetimes what would you do with it how would you spend it right how would how how would you spend your day how should how should you be a a a a mensch in the world and and mensch um is a yiddish word Mm -hmm. that means Mensch. That means <laughs> that means a, a good man. That means a, yeah, a yeah. person. Yes. Uh, and and so so to me, it it it, it hits on all those cylinders. Right. Uh, and so I look for a, a film. Uh, for me, comedies have to uh, tell something true about being human. Has to tell something true about what humans you know struggle with and and deal with in their lives. Has to. Uh, has to be based on some incredible impossibility or implausibility mm-hmm. uh, so that it doesn't have to be a fantasy like Groundhog Day. It can be something as simple as uh, that movie with James Gandolfini and Julie Louis-Dreyfus, Enough Said. Right, right. Which is just this really co- you know, simple, quiet story mm-hmm. uh, about a, a, a masseuse you who's know, kind of struggling – she meets a, a guy, uh, maybe he's going to be her new boyfriend. At the same time, she meets a client who becomes a best friend. And the client is the ex-wife of the new boyfriend <laughs> who hates James Gandolfini and keeps on saying terrible things about him, which starts to affect her relationship. Now, is that impossible? No. Mm-hmm. But it's improbable. Yeah. <laughs> so so you take... You take an improbable or impossible situation, and then you let it develop. That's the only time that you can lie in in, in a in a narrative, um, and then you let it develop honestly and organically. So a movie like Big, mm-hmm. it has one lie in it. A kid makes a wish on a fortune telling machine. He wakes up. He's the thirty year old man. Mm-hmm. Could that ever happen? No. But if it did happen, what would happen then? And every step of that movie develops organically and honestly out of that premise. Now, uh, some people might say, yeah, but how does he get a job uh, at a computer, uh, at a toy toy company? And the answer to that is because that's the theme. The theme of Big is sure. what's the connection between adulthood and childhood? Mm-hmm. So, of course, you want him to meet some guy who works in that field, in that area. What would be the point of him meeting a guy who who owns a gas station. So he right. ends up working at a gas station. It, you could do it, but it has nothing to do with the theme of the movie. So that, to me, are those three elements that make a great comedy. Car- uh, character, premise, and theme. Now, can you talk a little bit about what are the keys to making a good comedic lead? 
character um, because there is there's you know there's normal lead, leading man or leading woman, but a com- a good comedic leading character. What are some of the keys for that? I think the I think the the main key is the ability to to not only not take yourself seriously but make fun of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, a great example of that is John Hamm, who no, arguably great. you know did a great dramatic job in in, in Mad Men. But he's able to make fun of himself. He's able to uh, let himself be seen in in a ridiculous or negative light, and and not pretend that he's pre- that he's pretending to be that guy. He owns it, so that it's the ability to take the pie in the face and not pretend it's somebody else. Um, but that's what, for that's for more of an actor. But I'm talking about like on an actual character on a writing standpoint. What makes a good oh. leading character, comedic leading character, in a story? Yourself, yourself, or your 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 mom or your dad. So in other words, mm-hmm. when you're writing a character, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> rather than trying to make this character the stupidest guy you've ever seen, or the or the or the clumsiest guy you've ever seen. Uh, just tell the truth about yourself. All, all narrative, all fiction, is actually a autobiography. You're 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 writing about the world that you see, your perceptions, your take. And so, when you create a character, just make him as human as you are. Uh, people like to say, "Yeah, but my, you know, but my my character is uh, is is not that smart." And my answer to that is, "So, what makes you a genius?" Hmm. I mean, uh, you're, you know, uh, what I'd like to say is, you know, people are not as smart as they'd like to think they are. On the other hand, they're not as <laughs> stupid as they as they fear they are. They're right. just human. Right. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, my my best examples are the classic uh, sitcoms, All in the Family, and mm-hmm. Everybody Loves Raymond. Yes. The character of Archie Bunker. How did they come up with that character? Oh my god. Now it was it was based on a. Uh, a British sitcom, uh, Till Death Us Do Part, mm-hmm. in which a bigoted uh, a British guy was always com- always in battle with his liberal son-in-law. But when Norman Lear wrote that, he didn't give two figs for this British guy. He wrote his father. He put his father in the in the character of Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker always used to say "stifle" when he wanted Edith to stop talking. Mm-hmm. That wasn't an invention. That's what his father said to her. His father would say to his mother, "Stifle." One of the, uh, in one of the first episodes, Archie says to Meathead, he says, uh, "You are the laziest white man um, yeah, around." Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Meathead says, "That's racist." Well, then you're the yeah, you know, and then he makes something else, and it's exactly what his father said to Norman Lear. He wow. just took it from life. And the same thing uh, in terms of uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. In, you know, Ray Romano's uh, Italian, mm-hmm. but Phil Rosenthal, who wrote the pilot and was the executive producer, is Jewish. That mother, it's his mother. Mm-hmm. That father is his father. Mm-hmm. Yes, they, they, um, he used some of the autobiographical elements from Ray Romano's comedy, but he doesn't live – in 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 Ray Romano's skin, he doesn't walk in his shoes. He's he lives in his own skin, and so he offered his own family <laughs> as the as the grist for that comedy mill. So, how do you create a great character? Look in the mirror. That's and a and answer. and and if your if your mirror isn't wide enough, then go home, go home <laughs> for Christmas or Thanksgiving. <laughs> And look in the mirror, but you know, take a selfie with all those people behind. Look, when we get together mm-hmm. at, at family gatherings with our cousins, what are we laughing at? We're laughing at our family. We're laughing at our Stars, uncles and yeah. aunts and, and how crazy they are. Just just own it. Just share it. The hardest thing in the world is to give up the veneer of respectability and normalcy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all want to appear smart and capable and this and that. And we know deep in our heart of hearts how truly messed up 
and how broken and how crazy we are, but we want to hide that at all times. In comedy, we don't hide anymore. We yeah. just... We just let it out, and you, it being you have to be authentic is what you're saying, and be vulnerable uh, as yeah. a as a writer. Yeah, and as George Burns once said, the secret of success in show business is authenticity. Mm-hmm. And the minute you learn how to fake it, you've got it made. <laughs> very true. Very true. Um, uh, no, I heard a quote I actually used in one of my uh, podcasts the other day. Is like your best, the best friend you have in Hollywood is someone who stabs you in the face. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's that was such a great line. <laughs> I had to use it. It was a great, great line. Now, now let me ask you, how does comedy structure differ from dramatic structure? Because uh, we we're beaten in with the you know this you know dramatic structure, but there isn't a lot of talk about how comedic structure is different. Well, uh, when you're talking about structure, you're talking about a three act structure mm-hmm. or uh, Michael Haig has his six turning points. Mm-hmm. It's not uh, what's what's different about uh, the uh, the comic hero's journey, as mm-hmm. it were, mm-hmm. um, from the hero's journey. And I use that term only because you have a book called the comics, the he- comics, comics hero's journey, journey. <laughs> uh, which uh, my friend, Chris Vogler wrote the writer's journey. And I, I called him up and I said, Chris, um, I'm, I'm ripping you off, but it's with love. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm taking your title and I'm, I'm making fun of it, but out of love. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, so I think what, one of the differences is, uh, when creating when creating a structure uh, in a comedy, it, like I say, is that you get to make up crap, make up shit once, mm-hmm. and then you have to play it, play it straight and play it honestly. So if this weird thing really happened, if I'm in this weird situation, what would happen then? Uh, so so rather than thinking about um, a plot. You're thinking about character. You're following the character through the narrative as opposed to, and let's throw this at the character and that at the character. So in one sense, uh, dramatic structure is uh, a character, you know, heroes have to be thrown obstacles. Otherwise, they'll just win, right? Mm-hmm. But think about us. Think about people. We we can't even, you know, we can't even get out of the house on time. Uh, let alone have an obstacle thrown at us. Um, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Like not being able to you get the cup of coffee. It's, it's no, right. There's no. It's, I didn't ask for soy. I asked for whole milk. Ah, and well, that the right. whole the whole day's gone. Right. So 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 rather than thinking in terms of okay, we've got to throw this obstacle at them. We have to have this villain. What you notice from watching a lot of comedies um, is that you don't need. Villains. You don't need antagonists uh, mm. in comedies. Sometimes there are simply because of the structure of the story, but you don't need them. Who's the antagonist in Groundhog Day? It's himself. Yeah. He's, he has to. He has to uh, evolve from himself. Who's the antagonist in Forty Year Old Virgin? There is none. No one's trying to stop him from getting laid. Right. He, he, has to, he has to break through his own it, thing. In fact, in fact, everybody is, is, is hell bent <laughs> trying to help him. <laughs> right. Um, so, so, so there's there's a number of differences uh, in in uh, a dramatic structure. You have uh, a hero who has all the skills they need uh, to to do whatever they need to do. Bruce Willis and Die Hard. Hmm. No, he walks on glass with with no shoes and he kills all he kills like eight dozen bad guys. And and he's and he he has wisecracks all the way throughout. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's got all the skills in the world. And so you have to keep on figuring out how how can I make it harder on him and harder on him? Whereas in, in in a comic structure, your hero starts off with a minus, a negative. They're broken. They have a hole inside them that they don't know. They're not aware of. So in the beginning of a comic story, your character thinks that they're fine. We in the audience can tell, well, that guy, uh, Phil Connors in Groundhog Day, he's a jerk. Uh, That guy, Andy, in 40-Year-Old Virgin, 
he's a dweeb. He needs to, you know, meet a girl. Mm -hmm. But they think everything's going okay. They don't want to rock the boat. And when something happens to, to rock their boat, the first thing they try to do is they go into denial. It's not happening or they, or they desperately want to go back to the normal world that they think is working for them that we, that we see is not. Mm -hmm. And then what happens over the course of the structure as they, as these broken people who start their stories off with, with damaged or absent relationships, they gather families around themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so, Everybody, uh, every character, every hero character in a comedy is is forming a kind of dysfunctional family around themselves to help them through their transformation. Uh, and as and when they get to the end, uh, they uh, there's usually a uh, a segment in which there is and this this is similar in in dramas. There's an all is lost moment. Right. Uh, but what's what's why that's so important for comedy is that people sometimes forget that the most important moment in a comedy is the pain, is the loss, <laughs> is how characters deal with that pain and that loss, as opposed to, well, let's just make it funny. Well, here's another funny thing. Well, here's another funny thing. Wouldn't it be funny if we do this or wouldn't it be funny if we do that? So so part of the part of the difference of the structure is that in, in the hero's journey, the hero goes off into the unknown world and brings back an elixir that will heal the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. In the comic hero's journey, the the comic hero is thrown uh, inadvertently or against their better judgment or against their will into a world they don't want to be in and as a result have to transform and thereby heal themselves to be ed to be able to be better able to be uh, a person a mensch mm -hmm. in the world so they're not really changing the world as much as they're changing themselves so all comedy is transformational that makes uh, uh, that makes amazing sense. <laughs> a character in a comedy uh, doesn't realize that they have to change, but they have to change because the world as they knew it is taken away from them. They're they're in Oz, mm -hmm. or or they're uh, they're a thirty year old man when they're really twelve years old, or they are living the same day over and over again, mm -hmm. or um, they just find themselves in, in, in a weird situation. And what do they have to do? They have to. They have to become different, even though they don't want to become different. And over the course, so another difference in structure is that in, in a in a dramatic structure, your hero has a goal in the beginning of the movie. I'm going to catch the killer, or or I'm going to solve this mystery, or uh, I'm going. You know, what does Luke say in the beginning of Star Wars? He says, "I want to I want to be a pilot. I want to join the rebellion." So what happens by the end of Star Wars? He saves the rebellion. <laughs> He's a pilot, and he joins the rebellion. <laughs> right. But in in a comedy, your hero has a short sighted goal. Their initial goal is is wrong headed or short sighted. What is uh, what does uh, the kid in Big want? He just wants to be big enough to ride on a on a ride at a carnival to be with the girl of his dreams. Right. What does uh, Phil Connors want. He just, just wants, wants to, to get a job. Well, he just wants, no, in the beginning, yeah. he just wants to get a better job at a bigger uh, uh, news station where he can be a weatherman uh, in a bigger station, bigger, a yeah. bigger network. Yeah. Um, in, in 40 year old virgin, what does Andy want? All he wants is to be left alone because <laughs> his days are filled. He's, you know, he's uh, playing Halo. He's <laughs> practicing the tuba. He's painting his little figurines. He's happy. Yeah. He thinks he's happy. Right. So, so what happens in a comedy is that your characters have a discovered goal, mm -hmm. a goal that wasn't apparent to them or us in the audience at the beginning of the movie that later becomes something they discover as they're transforming. And, and so midway or a half, you know, three quarters of the way through or 40% or of the way through, they discover that they want something else. They want something new. And then they put all their uh, attention and focus to try to get that discovered goal. 
That's yeah. That's a great, great, great answer, sir, to a to a question. Um, yes, the heroes, the, the comics here. heroes journey. It's it's quite. It's it's all there. It's all there. It's all in here. It's all in here. Um, Available now, on Amazon and uh, Kindle. <laughs> Do you have the audiobook yet? No, no. I'm. I'm uh, e- even though I have a face that's ra- that's great for radio. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm not. Uh, audiobooks are. People have asked me about audiobooks, but what they don't realize is that you have to pay uh, – unless you're sure. uh, James Comey and somebody's asked you to make one, um, uh, you have to pay to make an audiobook and then your publisher has to flog it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, a it's thing. actually it's a thing. N- not, as, not as easy as p- people like to think it is. Also – Having to stay in in a studio and read this entire freaking thing. Oh man, I'm going uh, through. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. You, are I know. you doing the audio version of your I, book? I am doing the audio version of my book, but I'm a podcaster and I've been podcasting yeah, so, for a long time and I have the yeah, gear. There you go. So yeah. I'm doing it, but it is. It's not like this voice. I when I'm reading the book, it's not like, "Hey guys, how you doing?" It's not that. It's and today, so I have my my audiobook voice, which you're, is you're you're like the NPR girls on the SNL sketch. <laughs> right? Today, so we have sweaty, the sweaty, balls. Sh- sweaty balls today. <laughs> so it's it's similar to that, but not completely. Right. Uh, but sweaty balls, what a great what a great bit. Um, now I wanted to also I wanted to touch upon uh, um, a genre of comedy, which uh, and I just want to hear your thoughts on it. Fish out of water, which is such a great comedic world to be thrown into like the crocodile right. dundees the beverly hills cops you know those kind of things any tips on what what writers can do to do because I, th- I haven't seen a good fish out of water comedy in a long time honestly what was the last good one you saw well i mean there's 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 been a dearth of great um uh, great film comedy most m- almost everything that's really good mm-hmm. uh, or a lot of everything that's really good is happening uh in, on TV or streaming, yeah, um, yeah, there's, that's very true. Yeah, the the, the Grace and uh, Grace and Frankies of the world. I, and- I, I guess, I guess, you know, Spy with Melissa McCarthy. She was a fish out of water. That, that would be a yeah. That was funny as hell too. Uh, I love that. Movie. You know, f- for me, for me, uh, we are all fish out of water. Mm. We're swimming around. It's everything seems great, and then we're forced as as as. Uh, as uh, Amy Sherman Palladino uh, wrote, uh, we're forced out through a, through a hole that's smaller than a lady's purse, <laughs> and we're we're thrust into a world we didn't make, we didn't ask for, and we don't know how the hell we got there. We we can't do anything. We are fish out of water. Our our whole lives are fish out of water. We we like to pretend that we're in water you know mm-hmm. we're, we're we're swimming in our waters but for the most part uh everybody is a tail of a fish out of water in fact that's why that's why comedians uh who are outsiders in their culture mm-hmm. uh are are so successful that's why canadians are so successful <laughs> in america in, right <laughs> yeah because because they're they're you know uh perspective they is can't, a little, yeah they can't uh, fight the inc- you know the encroaching American culture, but they're they're kind of outsiders to it. African Americans, you know, Jews, you know, all the uh, all the ethnic comedians who came up uh, in the twenties and thirties and forties. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're in a way outsiders, uh, and so and so in that way, everybody's story is a fish out of water. Very very true. Now there's an. And- uh-huh. And when you when you when you take a situ- uh, a situation in which you tear somebody away from what his normal world is, you create a fish out of water. Mm-hmm. Bill Murray's a fish out of water. He's living the same day over and over again. The character of Big is a fish out of water. So a fish out of water just doesn't mean um, uh, a a a nerd. Uh, gets uh, caught in a space capsule and has to be the v- world's first astronaut. Right. I mean, they've actually made that movie, <laughs> but, that's, but that's not the only way to. That's not the only way to tell that story. Got it. Got it. So, so uh, you, what you're saying? Because I'm, I'm calling it more of like when I say fish out of water, it's more like the Beverly Hills Cop, literally the right. Troy Cop in Beverly Hills, completely out of out of his place. But you're saying that there's elements of that in almost every story, uh, in one way, shape, or form, almost, especially in comics. Yeah. 
Well, in 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 a comedy, once the characters have have um, uh, experienced what I call the WTF moment, mm-hmm. uh, they are in fact fish out of water who f- at first desperately try to swim back to uh, to more familiar more familiar waters. Mm-hmm. Tropic Thunder. <laughs> you have a bunch. Of, you have a bunch of actors <laughs> pretending to be in Vietnam. Uh, the director uh, is is literally getting punched out by the studio head, uh, and uh, he gets this idea uh, given to him by by Nick Nolte uh, to bring everybody uh, out into country to have them experience what it would be like if they were really in country in, in Vietnam. And two minutes in, he gets blown up, and they're they're stranded, and they have to make their way back to the extraction point to get back to their hotels. Right. They're automatically fish out of water. Right. They're forced to be soldiers when they don't want to be soldiers. They're actors. And and only only one of them, Jay Baruchel, only one of them's actually read the the manual so he knows how to read a map. <laughs> Fair. So so I it, it would be hard for me to think of a, a movie in which your character isn't a fish out of water at some point. That's a very good analogy. Very, very good. Um, now, romantic comedies, which is a whole other subgenre of what we're talking yeah. about. That's a whole other beast. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, what makes good romantic comedies work? Because when it's good, it's really good. You know, when when Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle, you know, um, Annie the- Hall – uh, right. Those, I mean, th- when they work, they are just hitting on all pistons. But there's been a lot of bad ones too. <laughs> well, the 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 I I I'm remembering. I can't remember the name, but uh, but uh, they they all have Catherine Hagel, um, and um, <laughs> oh um, and, and the guy the guy from Three Hundred. What's uh, the yeah yeah J- Jared uh, Jared Butler. Gerald Butler. They they all they all feature Catherine Hagel and Gerald Butler and. Um, I remember watching this movie and about 15 minutes in, she's up a tree spying on him. And I'm thinking, oh, that'll happen. (laughs) (laughs) Here's here's the problem with bad romantic comedy movies. They think that romantic comedy is about getting two people who are destined to be together. Mm -hmm. And then because they're destined to be together, you have to come up with ways of keeping them apart let's just come up with ways of keeping them apart but that's not really the problem that people have in relationships people don't have the problem of keeping you apart the problem is how do you stay together and not kill each other yes absolutely so the so the the really good romantic comedies are uh you know, uh, I guess I would put Sleepless in Seattle as an exception mm-hmm. because that's that's really a romantic comedy in which two faded people who are apart the entire figure, out a way to, figure out a way to get together. Right. Uh, but but, you know, but they start off on opposite ends of the country. You don't have to create uh, an artificial obstacle to keep them apart. But but movies like um, When Harry Met Sally. Pretty Woman. Um, Pretty, well, yeah, Pretty Woman. I, I, to me, that's not uh, really uh, a great example of the genre. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm thinking more like Five Hundred Days of Summer. Yes. Um, uh, Annie Hall, uh, of course. Uh, Annie Hall. Uh, even, even uh, uh, about a boy, which is oh. not a not a romantic comedy in in so far as uh, Hugh Grant is going to be uh, romantically involved with that boy, but it is a romantic comedy because it's about him. Connecting with somebody else besides himself, or, or Notting Hill, that was another really. Or good. not, or Notting, Notting Hill. Hill. That's a great and one. And it's all about not how do you overcome these artificial obstacles. It's how do you figure out how to stay together with the obstacles that are there to begin with. You're two different human beings. You're 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 you have different DNA. Mm-hmm. You, your molecules rotate and vibrate at different frequencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the the real problem in in relationships is once we figure out how to swipe right and swipe left, 
you know, is then when we meet, how do you how do you stay together? I mean, because fifty percent of all marriages end in divorce. Mm-hmm. So that's so staying together is not easy. You don't have to create an obstacle. You have to figure out how do we stay together. How do we figure out how to be one in a pair as opposed to the one that we know? So, so that's that's what I think uh, a good romantic comedy is. A good romantic comedy explores how we are in relationships and what we do in relationships and and why we're so bad at relationships as opposed to, well, these two people are just going to love each other unless we put some kind of wall between them. They're just going to break through that wall and and rut like animals. No, Mm -hmm. no, they're, you know, people, people have a hard time being in the same room with each other. How do you get past that? I mean, when Harry Met Sally is a really great example of that. Yeah, and that, that whole exploration was. I mean, Nora Ephron was probably one of the geniuses in the genre, without question. Um, and even Notting Hill, it's about. It's not. They have obstacles, but the obstacles are just what pack, what baggage they bring each each of them bring to the to the relationship. Julia exactly. Roberts is a movie star. He's a right. book. He's a book store owner. How are we going to make this work? We love each other, but how are we going to stay together? And it's about how do we stay together? Exactly. As opposed to how do we get them together? You know, how do we keep them apart for 90 minutes? Right. Uh, one of the examples that I use in my workshops, um, uh, when people ask me this question, I show them a couple of scenes from Dan in Real Life, which was oh, – uh, yeah, 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 Steve Carell. Yeah. Steve Carell. And, and Dan in Real Life uh, – uh, this uh, uh, Steve Carell is a, a widower. He's been depressed for two years. He meets this wonderful woman, Julia Binoche, in a bookstore. And they chat and they talk. Uh, and he goes back to, because they're having like a family reunion at this, you know, unbelievable, uh, perfect house with the perfect family and the perfect <laughs> everything. And he goes back. And, and everybody can tell that he's kind of hepped up about something and they say, what happened? And he says, I might have met a girl. And then uh, his brother, who's Dane Cook, and by the way, when you're in a movie and Dane Cook is out acting you, you're in trouble. <laughs> I, I just want to say that. Uh, Dane Cook uh, introduces his fiance, and it turns out to be Julia Binoche from the bookstore. And at that moment, the movie goes wrong. At that moment, Steve Carell lies and says oh hi what's your name okay here's the result of that later on in the movie about 40 minutes later because they're trying to pretend that they don't know each other he ends up fully clothed in a shower pretending to take a shower if your character ends up in a shower fully clothed you've made a wrong turn People don't do that. It doesn't happen in real life. Here's what would have been a better turn for them. She comes in the door and he says, well, we we actually know each other. Well, she's the girl I met in the bookstore and she might be embarrassed for a second. Mm -hmm. And then he would say, no, no, but now I can see Dane Cook while you love her because she's great. Congratulations, my brother. Right. And so the movie becomes how long can you fool yourself into thinking that you're happy for your brother as opposed to really wanting her for yourself? And that becomes, to my mind, much more a much more interesting movie yeah. than winding up in a shower fully clothed, getting wet. Because wouldn't it be funny if I had to pre- if I had to hide? Why is he hiding? Why? So he's talking to his brother's fiance. Why is he hiding in a in a shower? And somebody turns the shower on. And, and it's interesting because they they a lot of times when when I feel like when writers and directors uh, and even actors and performers when they 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 don't have that that hold on story structure, uh, or story or like what you're talking about or character or character exactly. What they, would be believable for the character? Right. They they then automatically lean on slapstick. They right. lean. They lean on like, how can we get a gag out of here? Like, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be they, funny? Wouldn't it be funny if? Wouldn't it be funny if? Um, there's uh, there's a great story about the making of Groundhog Day, mm-hmm. and in 
one of the earlier drafts in Groundhog Day when he wakes up and it's the third day and it's the third time in a row and he's, is it really happening? Am I going crazy? And in the script, uh, they have him shaving his head into a mohawk, destroying the room, setting fire to half the room, painting the other room in day cloak colors. He goes to sleep, six o'clock, Sonny and Cher are on the radio. He wakes up the same day. And they looked at that, they looked at those rushes and Harold Ramis and I, I'm I'm get I'm guessing Bill Murray or, or the producers looked at the looked at each other and said, Why would he cut his hair into a mohawk? <laughs> Why it's, would he do that? I mean visually how, visually it's funny, but it doesn't work. How well how does it help? It doesn't why help. This, right. Why would this character do that? And so at great expense, they reshot the scene. And all that happens in the scene, if you remember, is he breaks a pencil. <laughs> right. And he puts one down on the floor and he puts one on the nightstand and he wakes up the next morning and the pencil is whole and he knows it's happening. Right. And it's so brilliantly simple. Simple, honest and direct, as opposed to wouldn't it be funny if... And from that point on, as Steve Tapolowski, who has his own podcast, mm -hmm. relates that um, that from that moment on, the question always was, what would they really do? What would really happen? It, In it, fact, at the end of Groundhog Day, uh, there was this whole debate because he uh, Andy McDowell wins him in, in the bachelor auction right. and takes him home. And there was this whole debate on how the last scene should go. Did, did they have sex? What happened? Did, you know, would he wake up uh, like naked? Would he wake up? And they, they, it, rather than thinking, well, wouldn't it be funny if we do this? They, they put it to a vote. The entire cast and crew got to vote on what would happen that night. What would happen with these two characters? Because they were no longer fictional characters. They were real. They were human beings. Mm -hmm. And what would these two human beings do? And that's why, uh, spoiler, uh, at the next day, it turns out that all he did was fall asleep. And she, you know, Andy McDowell says, he just fell asleep. And he says, it was the end of a really long, long day. day. <laughs> it's just so brilliant. It's brilliant. It's, it's so brilliant. Br and the song is, a the song is different. When yeah, it pops on, exactly. it was, it was, yeah. it was great. Oh, such a, I got to watch that movie again. Um, it was so great. Um, I do want to also touch upon um, dark comedies. Um, yes. Specifically, one of my favorite dark comedies, Heathers, uh, which was uh, arguably a comedy. Um, yeah. But it is, it is funny as hell. Um, yeah. and, and you can't make that movie today. Like that movie would never in a million years be made today. Um, well, why can't you, why can't you make I it I think today? there's a lot of PC stuff that wouldn't get through. Like, I mean, like when I saw Blazing... Just, just, I, just killing, just killing, uh, uh, high the, schoolers. The school, you know, the school killings with the gun in the school. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just wouldn't fly yeah. today. Um, like when I saw Blazing Saddles for the first time, I was like, well, this, there's never, there's no way in hell that movie could be made today like it just it's just not gonna happen and i saw this years ago but even then uh and then borat showed up i was like well okay apparently everything's yeah. out the door <laughs> um but but with heather specifically that film um which is a it's a it's a it's a genius piece of work in my opinion how what are tips that you could give writers on how to write good dark comedies because again i haven't seen a lot of good dark comedies lately either i mean when was the last good dark comedy you saw mm. Um, it's hmm. a rarity in the genre now. Uh, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm thinking about things like Wag the Dog. Uh, yeah, that's still twenty years, uh, twenty five years ago. Yeah, yeah Doctor Strange Love. Of course. Um, I, I think. I think the 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 key. I mean, listen, Breaking Bad is a dark comedy. <laughs> In so many ways, it is. It was Mad, so brilliant. Mad Men is a dark comedy. In TV, uh, in TV, there is more of these examples. The, the Sopranos is a dark comedy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think. Yeah. I think the. Uh, besides the fact that that you know, it's one thing to make a, a television episode um, for uh, two point three million dollars, and it's another thing to make. Uh, a movie for forty to two hundred million dollars, hmm. uh, but I think the the thing you have to do is you have to 
know what who you're making fun of and what you're making fun of. Mm. And you have to punch up. Don't punch down. That's why Heathers was so smart. It punched so up above the the, the genre of high school. Right. Comedy. Well, it's it's also it's also you're there you're you're not making listen we're all living in a dark comedy, aren't we? Oh, God, we're, all, we're all whistling. <laughs> no, but not just today's political situation. Sure. We're all whistling past the graveyard. That's what all, <laughs> that's what all black comedy is. Oh, um, I, I guess this is also 20 years ago. Uh, uh, a fish called Wanda is kind of a dark. Comedy. Kind of a dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and what it all comes down to is as we're whistling past the graveyard, we're trying to make fun of the things that terrify us. Mm. So, to me, the the way to make a dark comedy is to focus on how the people are coping with it. How are they coping with it? Because in in, in a metaphorical sense, we're all struggling in a dark comedy, and and the the end of all our dark comedies is not too funny. Mm. You know, none of us, as they say, none of us get out of this alive. <laughs> so, Very or. True. or or as Clint Eastwood says in The Unforgiven, you know, um, we all get what's coming to us. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the the idea is that you're you're not pretending when you say that there's death and dismemberment out there waiting for you. How are you? How do people deal with that? How do they react to that? What happens to the living people as they grapple with these? Uh, issues of of death and destruction and extinction, uh, so that so that if you're if you're making a dark comedy, honestly, you're just finding what's ridiculous and absurd in in what in what we're doing to to deal with the fact that we're living you know we're on this uh, blue cinder spinning through a void. We don't know where we came from. We don't know where we're going to, and yet. We're going to wake up tomorrow and have frozen yogurt because frozen yogurt at least will make it a little bit better. You know, we are the only creature on the planet that knows that we will not be here eventually. Right. And what do we do based on that? Do we all sit home weeping softly, no. writing haiku? No. no. We wake up and we say, Thai. Thai food. Thai, I think th- that'll do it today. I think Thai. Do it. <laughs> thai, or, thai or or like uh, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate, of course. Eighty percent. Uh, Starbucks. Starbucks. Uh, every day, I'm Starbucks. Gonna, I'm going to spend three twenty-five because Starbucks will make my eventual descent into death and and <laughs> and entropy. It'll make it a little bit more worthwhile. <laughs> That's great. That's so amazing. Um, now, I have, uh, another question I have for you is, uh, and I'm curious to hear your answer on this: the difference between comedy. And funny, because there is a oh, difference. There is oh, a major difference. Absolutely. Um, I, I start a lot of my workshops workshops off with a comedy perception test. Mm-hmm. I, I give them seven different versions of a man slipping on a banana peel. <laughs> man slipping on a banana peel, man in top hat slipping, man <laughs> slipping on a banana peel after kicking a dog, man slipping on a banana peel after uh, losing his job. Blind man slipping on a banana peel, blind man's dog slipping on a banana peel, (laughs) man slipping on a banana peel and dying. And then I ask them, okay, select which one you think is the funniest, the least funniest, the most comic, and the least comic. And they'll go, somebody will go, well, what's the difference? And I'll go, excellent question. (laughs) I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Select which one you think is the funniest, the least funniest, the most comic, and the least comic. I don't answer the question. I just say, select which one you think. They could be different. They could be the same. And so then we'll start with, okay, how many of you here, whether it's 20 people or 300 people, how many of you here thought A, man slipping on a banana peel was the funniest? How many people thought D, man slipping on a banana peel after losing his job was the funniest? And so we'll go through all of that. And then at the end, I'll go and I'll say, so here's the answer to which one of these is the funniest. You're all right. You're all correct. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, don't you feel affirmed? It's like uh, the 60s. <laughs> Goodbye, y'all. All. We all get a participation uh, trophy. <laughs> because co- funny is subjective. Completely. 
what you think is funny is different from what you think is funny, and you're both right. Uh, but comedy is not subjective. Comedy is the art of telling what's true, and specifically telling what's true about human beings. So that so that even if I'm even if I'm creating a moment with a character that you are not laughing at, if I'm telling the truth about a human being without whitewashing them or without uh, just uh, ignoring some of their defects. It's comedy, even though you might not laugh. Uh, at the end of Dr. Strangelove, when he's when Slim Pickens is riding the bomb down to what we know is the, our entire extinction. Mm -hmm. Talk about black comedy. <laughs> Brilliant. There, some people in the audience laugh. There's a, the, a nervous titter. Mm -hmm. Many people don't. But it's not a dramatic moment. He's, As he's going, yippee, yeah, I, oh, I am. Yeah, right. It's a comedic moment, even if you're not laughing. So there's a difference between comedy and funny. Funny is what makes you laugh, and it's different from it for everybody. But comedy is telling the truth, telling the truthful story of a less than perfect person struggling against insurmountable odds without many of the required skills and tools with which to win, yet never giving up hope. And because of that, what I try to tell writers and directors and performers and executives is don't chase funny because, because you're chasing a fraction of the audience. Right. If, if, it, if, it, if it works, people will laugh. If it doesn't work, people won't laugh. Then, then, then change it after your previews. But tell the truth. Tell the truth in a truthful way, in, in an unexpected and yet, and yet ultimately uh, – uh, ultimately authentic. way, yeah, authentic, authentic way, yeah. thanks, uh, and, and comedy will occur. Also, make yourself laugh. I mean, you, you're a human being. Right. So, if, if you're so, not laughing, right, chances are they're not going to laugh. Don't try to outthink the audience. Don't try to think, what will they find funny? Well, wouldn't it be funny if I did this? Use your own sense of humor, only guided, uh, only kind of limited by – telling the story honestly and truthfully through character and theme. I'm going to ask you a deeper question here. When you say, and I think this is a, this is a question that will go through all, all, all writing, all storytelling, all art in general, is the ability to be honest, be authentic, be truthful. And what stops an artist from doing so? Because I, as an artist myself and the work that I do, uh, you know, one of the reasons why this podcast has done as well as it has over the years is because I'm completely authentic and I ask authentic questions and I want truth. Um, right. And that's why people gravitated towards it. Um, what stops the artist from doing so? Is it just pure fear of, of people making fun of them or of, you know, things like that? But I've always found that when I'm honest about my work, whether it be my writing, whether it be uh, like my new book, which is as honest as I could possibly be, uh, a film that I direct, when I'm honest about it, that's when, that's when the magic is. Uh, but it's scarier. Well, I'm not sure that there's one answer to that, but mm -hmm. I think part of that answer is is not trusting that your story is good enough mm -hmm. that that Fear. your that your uh, point of view is good enough um, worrying that other people won't enjoy it worrying that somebody who really knows finances but doesn't know art is telling you I don't think it's funny <laughs> okay, then then I'll look for somebody who does, and you won't produce it, or you won't you won't be my agent. But 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 I think it's it comes out of yeah, fear is part of it, but it comes out of the sense that that there's the sense that I'm not enough. For me, uh, a, a perfect example is the I'm going to pronounce her name wrong. Uh, it's the a director who directed uh, Enough Said. Um, uh, friends with money, uh, please give Nicole Holofcener. Okay, I'm, I don't know. Her I name think I'm. Either. I think I'm mispronouncing her name. Mm -hmm. She she uh, uh, she makes she makes these beautifully crafted 
beautiful movies, comic movies, and there's very little slapstick. There's there's no there's there's no uh, big uh, gags. There's no you know there's not a lot of uh, sex scenes. Um, uh, te- you know, thirteen year olds are not drawn to her movies, and yet her movies are wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it has a a kind of a limited viewership so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think people are worried that if they don't put in the big dick joke, mm-hmm. that that they won't make money or they are, or they won't sell or 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 the studio will be disappointed. So there's there's fear, and sometimes it's a justified fear because I mean, how many five star restaurants are there out there, and how many McDonald's are there out there? So if you're if you're studying to be a chef. Should you go to a McDonald's and see what's made them so successful? Different, bo- different model, different to everything. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you, you have uh, to strive towards your own sense of excellence, and know that that doesn't translate into uh, into an economic model necessarily. Wow. You just, uh, honestly, you've kind of blown my mind a little bit. Cause it just, there was that light bulb that just went off in my head when you said, if you're, you're, if you're trying to be a chef, if you're training to be a chef, why would you go to McDonald's to see how, because they're very successful. Yeah. But it's a different kind of success as opposed right. to why wouldn't you go to a Gordon Ramsay restaurant and and see how he's doing it and why you know, or a fine dining restaurant that has the five stars. Right. Let, let's not say Gordon Ramsay because I don't think that fair enough. It's yelled at. <laughs> fair enough. It's, it's one of the few chefs I know. Um, yeah. the, the Wolfgang. Park. I hate you, you omelet. Yes, you know? exactly. But um, but I think one of the issues with with Hollywood is in general is too. So many people go to watch studio movies. That are, right. are 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 financial vehicles. They're made right. for money. They're not made particularly for story. Every once in a while, someone sticks sneaks in a story. <laughs> Every once in a while, you get one of these. You know, that's, that has money behind it, has big stars, and has a story. But they're becoming rare and rare, um, much rare. But you know what the studio system does so well is taking stories that already work mm-hmm. and visualizing them. Correct. That's why the that's why the Marvel. Movies oh. do so well, yeah. Because those stories were great when they were ten cent comics, mm-hmm. and these great craftsmen and technicians and great actors mm-hmm. visualize them for us. But the story's already there; mm-hmm. the characters are already there. And and to give them credit, they don't screw the characters up. The Marvel characters were screwed up human beings to start off with when they were 10 and 12 cent comics, and they're still screwed up human beings. All the movies did was honor that, as opposed to Justice DC, League. <laughs> the DC movies in which they can't figure out the, – the stories came out of we're, we do right. We're the Justice League. We do right because that's the right thing to do. Guys. It's not enough. Really? Really? <laughs> <laughs> and so they 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 kind of veer veer between let's go as dark as possible and let's or let's have lots of wisecracks. They still have I haven't seen Aquaman. I understand Aquaman is is a little bit better than Well, than, Wonder than Woman Bruce. was wonderful. I thought Wonder Woman was wonderful. Wonder Woman was good. Um from the DC world. That is as from the DC, good as- from the from the DC world. I mean it was uh, it was female empowerment and it was uh in a in a period uh, that wasn't the modern day, so I think they 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 kind of solved it mm-hmm. uh, in, in a good way. Um, but you know, I, I think what 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 movies do so well is take existing stories mm-hmm. and and help us see them for who they are, like Lord of the Rings. Whereas if you want to see a really good movie, take a look at an independent, see what's coming out of Sundance, mm-hmm. see see what somebody has made. That wasn't made through the studio system, but made because this is the story I want to tell. Like eighth grade. Yeah, I I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's amazing. Oh, it's it's so good, and and it it obviously, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally wrong about this, but it but to me, it obviously wasn't made uh, after a story conference at Sony. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm almost positive it wasn't. Um, now, since one of your books is called The Hidden Tools of Comedy, can you give us a few hidden tools? Well, 
I, I've already given you a couple. Okay. Um, we start off with uh, with the paradigm, what I call the comedy equation. Mm-hmm. Comedy is about an ordinary guy or gal. Jackie Gleason used to call him a moke. Mm-hmm. Uh, struggling against insurmountable odds without many of the required skills and tools with which to win, yet never giving up hope. Now, from that paradigm, we draw usable practical tools, the tool of winning. Comedy gives your characters the permission to win. Um, not that they're trying to be funny, but they're trying to win. Um, I, do, I do an exercise in, in, my, in my workshop. I ask three people who I make sure are not performers. And I tell them that they're lawyers and the most important court case in, the, in their careers began in a courthouse four blocks away five minutes ago. I tell them, I say to them, what, what, would, uh, what, what should you do to solve the problem? And they or people in the audience say they should run there. And I'll ask them, what would actors do? And they say actors would talk about it. They'd create dialogue. <laughs> so then I tell them, okay, for muscle memory, just run out the door. You're three lawyers. You're five minutes late, four blocks away. Run out the door. So they run out the door. Then I bring them each in individually and I say, okay, here's the crazy thing. For some crazy reason, you have to be the second person out the door. Don't tell the others. And I'll bring each of the three in. I'll tell them, you have to be second. <laughs> I'll bring them all in. Now, these are not performers. Sure. I bring them all in, and I say, most important case of the three lawyers, most important case happened starting five minutes ago, started five minutes ago, and a courthouse four blocks away, go. And what will happen is they'll rush to the door and then begin this odd little dance <laughs> of, of trying to trying to get through the door. And occasionally, somebody will figure it out, but most often, I'll have to side coach and say, I give you the permission to do what you need to do in order to win. Mm -hmm. And what I usually do is I usually pick two big guys and a tiny girl. Right, right. And at at some point, one of the big guys gets the idea, oh, I don't have to be a gentleman. Picks up the girl, throws her outside, leaves. So he can be second. (laughs) It's an experiment. It doesn't work the same way all the time. It doesn't work all the time. But invariably, the audience laughs. And I'll bring the people back out and I'll say, who directed that? And they'll say, no one. And I'll say to the audience, I'm sorry, directors, I'm sorry. We don't need directors. And I'll say, who wrote that scene? And they'll say, no one. Or they'll say, you did, Mr. Kaplan, because, Mm -hmm. no, I said, I didn't write it. I just set up this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. What happened at the door, that was was you. And so I'll say, you don't need, you don't need directors. You don't even need writers. You just need characters who are given the permission to do what they need to do in order to win. Because when they were doing that weird dance at the door, they weren't trying to be funny. They were simply trying to solve a problem, an unsolvable problem, as it turns out, but simply trying to solve a problem. So rather than trying to be funny, characters are given the permission to do what they need to do in order to win, which is why when Woody Allen is arguing with some guy at, at, on a, at a movie, on a line at a movie, He's able to drag Marshall McLuhan out from behind a poster in Annie Hall to win his argument. It's brilliant. That was such a brilliant move. I love that. Be, be oh. caught, you know, although now that I find out that Woody Allen is really a creepy pervert, yes, yes, yes. You know, that's unfortunately not all the best people are are, are great artists, and yes. he happens to be one of the not great people. But right, um, but so so winning the idea that comedy gives you the permission to win is one of the tools. Non-hero, not the, not a, a comic hero, not a fool, not a ridiculous person, but simply somebody who lacks some, if not all, the essential skills and tools with which to win. Um, straight line, wavy line. Most people think of comedians, uh, comics as funny people, and then they're the straight man, mm-hmm. the straight man who kind of just set the funny people up to do something funny. Right. And, uh, and, what what the tool of straight line wavy line does is it recognizes the fact that that's a false dynamic. Uh, John Cleese once said that when they started Monty Python, they thought that comedy was watching somebody do something silly. They later came to realize that comedy is watching somebody watch somebody do something silly. Watching somebody watch somebody do something silly. So that in 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 a 
uh, in a comic dynamic. You have somebody who's blind to a problem or creating the problem, like Kramer, and somebody mm -hmm. who's struggling with the problem, but because they're a non-hero, they can't solve the problem, like Jerry. So if you look at comedy, if you look at sitcoms, you're always seeing a straight line, somebody who's kind of blind to who they are or what they're doing, like Joey mm -hmm. in Friends, and somebody who kind of notices it but doesn't quite know exactly how to deal with it or what to say to it, like Chandler. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have this dynamic. Um, and, and the dynamic can switch because it's not about character, it's about focus. Who is the story about at that moment who's in focus? And so... So those are some of the tools and the hidden tools of comedy, along with archetypes, comic premise, metaphoric relationships, a also, lot of stuff. Also, so, so two hundred and eighty pages of genius. It's so obviously, obviously, sir. Uh, now you have mentioned it a few times, but let's talk about your two books that you have out. Okay. Um, the hidden tools mean, of comedy. You mean this book? Yes. And this book? Yes, those two books. Yes. It's funny you should mention that. <laughs> Tell us about your, your 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 older book is uh um the for the book that first came out was the hidden tools of comedy which right. is uh, done very very well uh, so tell us right. a little bit about that well like I said it's uh it basically talks about the things that are not taught at AFI or USC or or NYU um, because people still think comedy is well let's do something funny let's let's do some gags and it it talks about the things that actually create, increase or decrease the comedic elements in a, in a scene um, and what you can do. Because it's not about, well, you're just born funny. It's about if you give a character skills, if you have them be a hero, you're creating a dramatic moment. And a skill could be something as simple as awareness. Kind of so when a character is aware of his situation, that could depress him. Mm -hmm. That's a dramatic moment. But if a character isn't aware, is kind of blithely just going along, not realizing how screwed up they are and how hopeless their situation is, that's a comedic moment. So you can actually increase or decrease the comedic elements in a scene or the dramatic elements in a scene simply by giving or taking away skills for your character. Got it. And then now your new book, The Comedic Hero's Journey, we've kind of touched upon a lot of the and, elements and, of and that. that. And that basically uh, it, it kind of is a riff on the, on the hero's journey mm -hmm. uh, and talks about, so what happens in the comic hero's journey? What, what differences are there? What tweaks do you have to make? And how is that journey different, either, either in a great way or, or in a subtle way, different from the dramatic hero's journey? And it's, it's uh, as I say, it's serious story structure for fabulously funny film. <laughs> now, I also heard you had a few workshops coming up. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I do is I go around um, uh, and uh, do these, for the most part, they're two-day workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and you can find out all about them on my website, KaplanComedy.com. That's Kaplan with a K, sure. Comedy with a C. Because if I spelled comedy with a K, that would make me a hack. So right, I, I obviously, just, it's got to be <laughs> Kaplan Comedy All One Word dot com. Uh, so uh, we're doing one in Belgium, in Brussels. That must be amazing. on February sixteenth and seventeenth. Um, I don't speak Belgium, but they speak comedy, so I think we'll be okay. Uh, and then I'm in Los Angeles in March, March second and third. And I'm in London on April 27th and 28th. And I think I might be going to New York or San Francisco later in the year, but those still have to be worked out. That's um, that's amazing. And because uh, you mentioned Belgium um, or Brussels, what? Um, how does comedy – because comedy doesn't travel well. What's funny in one it, country is not funny in another. It does. But, if you, but funny doesn't, but comedy does. Right. Um, it – you know what's uh, the language may, di may may be different. I've I've taught these workshops in Singapore, mm -hmm. in Melbourne, in Paris, in Kiev. The language may be different, culture, customs, government sure. may be different, but people are the same. We all we're all born, we all go to school, uh, we all have secrets from our parents. 
Our parents have secrets from us. Mm-hmm. We all want to fall in love or, or, or get as much love, uh, however we define it, mm-hmm. any way we can. We have relationships or married. We have kids. Uh, we have parents. We have uncles. I mean, human beings are the same all over the world, even though we might use different words for different objects, sure. even though um, uh, some customs might be different. Uh, but but people are the people stay the same. And what I've noticed going around the world is that I can show a clip from an American movie or or a American television show, and people laugh because they understand what's happening to those people in that situation. And 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 so so there's people all over the world can laugh at Groundhog Day, even if they don't speak English as the first language. Fair enough. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, last questions I ask all my guests. Okay. What advice? I'm a Libra. Um, <laughs> my favorite, I was, my favorite color is blue. I was I like long walks on the beach. I was born a small child. Uh, <laughs> I was I was born at a very early age. <laughs> That's great. That was actually that's yeah. a great line. That's a great line. <laughs> that, no, that's for, that's from my that's from my palm reading uh, bit. Uh, I see you were born at a very early, early age. age. <laughs> I'm good. I have to tell you, I will steal that for parties. Okay. Uh, please. <laughs> now, what advice would you give a, a screenwriter or or a comedic writer wanting to break into the business today? Okay, I would recommend three things. Buy your books. First, Buy your books, obviously. Uh, that's actually not my recommendation, but thank you for <laughs> thank you for putting that out there. Uh, I would recommend three things. One, take an improv class. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't want to perform, even if you're not looking to be on SNL or part of uh, UCB, comedy is an actor centric art form. It's about the character. So the some of the best training you can get is to be is to be in a class where you pretend or you practice being a character, seeing through a character's eyes, hearing through a character's ears. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that as you're writing, and we're talking about screenwriters, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Hear your stuff right out loud. You cannot figure out what's what's happening just based upon you and your screen or you and your your, uh, legal pad. Mm -hmm. You have to get people in a room half of them reading parts, half of them just listening, tape it because you're going to go into a coma at certain parts where where it's not working and listen to what is happening when human beings say your words in context. Uh, I also, I also suggest that you have wine and cheese, (laughs) much wine (laughs) and plenty wine, plenty, plenty (laughs) wine. But you have to, you have to hear it read out loud because comedy doesn't exist in your head or in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And and the third thing is, is that no one ever got a a job because you, they have a, they have a great resume with a great font. (laughs) It's, it's all about who, you know, and who you have gone to college with or went to summer camp with. So one of the things I tell people to do is uh, is all the stories that they've heard about, about some guy who, uh, who went to a dentist and the dentist uh, also did the teeth of Jim Carrey and they got a script. Those things are obnoxious, but something like that does happen. Oh, yeah. So that so – that What you need to do is you need to make a list of everybody who you've ever known or might have known or stood in back of a line at Starbucks. And you want to make sure that you you maintain those connections and you want to maintain you want to know that you have no idea where your next job is coming from. So your job is to be out there in the universe, say yes to the universe. I don't want to go to the screen and go. You don't know who you're going to meet. I don't want to take this class. Take it. You don't know who you're going to meet. Because your next job is going to come from somebody who knows you. And that's not networking, just networking for networking's sake. Like, you know, when you're at a party and somebody's looking over your shoulder to see who else came in the door. Because you don't have any idea who's going to help you. Mm -hmm. And the best way to figure out who's going to help you is for you to help other people. Be on a film crew. Yep. Uh, uh, Help out. Uh, uh, Be part of a reading uh, you know, uh, uh, hold a, hold, hold a microphone, hold a boom and see where it leads you because there are a million ways to break into the business, 
but you can't break into the business sitting at home wondering how am I going to break into the business. <laughs> I was talking to uh, Daniel Knopf, uh, the creator of uh, Carnival, and um, and he said, he's like, ours is the only business that has larceny in it. How do you break into the business? How do you – and he's like, it's true. Like, you never – like, how do I break into the cookie business? Like, no one says that. <laughs> People always want to break in or, you know, how do I break through the door? It's always larceny involved in not breaking into this business. Well, I'll say I'll say there's one other thing yeah. uh, there. there It's really simple, uh, but there are, and there are only two rules. Rule one, number one, be brilliant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rule number two, let people know about it. That's a cr- that's it, man. That's it. If you've got a story and you've written a script and nobody wants it, turn it into a novel. Make yep. it up, make it a podcast, write a blog, get it out there, let people know about it because you don't know what's going to happen. I, I had a client, um, uh, a guy I, I, I worked with uh, on a, uh, a trip to Australia through, uh, through Screen Australia and Film Victoria. Mm-hmm. And he wrote this wonderful script about uh, a guy on the Asperger's spectrum mm-hmm. uh, who, was, who came up with a way of, of getting a relationship for himself. And he wrote the script. I thought the script was funny. Nobody wanted it. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially Australia is the kind of place where you get government funding, mm-hmm. um, and the government doesn't want to fund silly comedies. They want to fund uh, serious works about itinerant, inarticulate uh, sheep herders who are on a uh, on a lighthouse in Tasmania who haven't talked to anybody in ten years. Yes. That they'll fund. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I so what he did was he said. F this. I think it's a great story. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not a young, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm, I, I've, I've made the bad decision to be over 50. So I'm going to write this as a novel. So he wrote it as a novel. It got published and it got optioned by the same people who turned down his screenplay. <laughs> and as part of his option, he gets to write the first screenplay. <laughs> so, so, so there's there's more than one way to skin a cat. Sure. Uh, when I was doing a project for HBO, uh, they had this performance space in in Hollywood. I think now it, it's gotten taken over by Comedy Central, mm-hmm. and uh, we we had this one actress who did did a show. And uh, she was pretty funny, but she, for some reason, she wasn't getting any jobs. So she wrote a one-person show for herself, uh, and she did it uh, at the at the HBO workspace, which no longer is there. So don't don't ask me to sure sure to, sure. Give, to give you an end to the HBO because they're no longer there. Uh, and we did it, and people from HBO came to see it, and people laughed. It they loved it. Nothing happened. She didn't just say, well, I guess I'll just have to work at Starbucks now for the rest of my life. She rented a theater on uh, on Melrose mm-hmm. and ran it one night a week for like a year. And she went to uh, the kind of groups that she thought would b- come to see it. Uh, she sold tickets. One night, uh, uh, a woman named Rita Wilson came. Rita Wilson is Tom Hanks' uh, wife. And because Rita Wilson was intrigued by her title. My big, big fat, fat Greek, Greek wedding. Greek wedding. Yeah. And she saw it and she saw Nia Vardalis do this one person show. And she brought Tom Hanks the next week and Platon made it. And it was the highest grossing independent romantic comedy ever made. Yep. Because she had something brilliant. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She didn't just send the script you know, to the same person over and over again. She said, if they don't want this, I'm just going to keep showing it till somebody comes along who does want it. Mm-hmm. So, so Gotta hustle. Be, bril- be brilliant, let people know about it. And, and while you're not taking no for an answer, mm-hmm. figure out a way to not live on your credit card. <laughs> exactly. Please. That, that'll shit come back. That'll shit will come back to bite you in the ass. Oh, and then some, my friend, and then some. Um, now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career, besides your own, obviously? Wow. Um, I, I, I guess. Uh, 
I guess uh, I would I would have to say uh, Lord of the Rings. Okay. Yeah. I read that I read that when I was a kid, uh, and it took me to a different world. It took me to a different world when uh, I was um, I was not a very happy kid, mm-hmm. and it it showed me the power of the ima- of imagination. So I knew I knew even if the my world wasn't working out for me, uh, a world in my imagination could. So. Maybe that's go. what. Maybe that's where I should go. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Hmm. You can't force funny. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You um, cannot force funny. Now, um, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Ah. Uh, Godfather, okay. Groundhog, Groundhog's Day, and um, I have a three-way tie um, uh, between It's a Wonderful Life, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, mm-hmm. and um, uh, oh, God damn it, Gene Kelly, Dancing in the Rain. Okay, Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain. Singing in, in the Rain. rain. Um, and then, uh, just for you, oh, 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 four way tie, uh, huh. the sting. Oh, such a great film. I love this thing. You see, that's a movie that holds that holds still oh, to this day. Brilliant. It's such because a it starts, it starts with loss. Yeah, no, it, it's, starts, it starts with death. Yep. And absolutely. there's death, there's death near the, near the end. There's sadness and death. Um, now, uh, and I normally don't ask this question, but I have to ask you three of your favorite screenplays of all time. That when you wrote, when you, you know, comedic stuff that you read, and you're like, Jesus, this is good. Uh, I uh, Groundhog Day. Uh huh. Um, but the finished script, not not like uh, right. Unfortunately, Annie Hall. Yes, I look. I know. Look, we all apologize for it. It is still a brilliant. He Who ruined knew? it. He re- he ruined it, but it's still a brilliant piece of art, regardless of the artist. Right. Um. And uh, every Billy Wilder screenplay ever written. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone listening, if you guys do not know who Billy Wilder is, please do yourself a favor. How could you not know who Billy Wilder I mean, is? No, there's, look, there's a lot. Indie film hustle. Look, there's a lot of, look, there's a lot of youngins listening or watching this. Please go watch something like, uh, oh uh, some like it hot. Apartment. The apartment. Some like it hot. Uh, <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. Oh, please. Please go, go, okay. go read a bit. Okay. Now, where can people find you and your work, sir? They can find me, um, uh, uh, at kaplancomedy.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, my Twitter, uh, handle is at SK comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, Kaplan comedy, or you can friend me. Uh, now I have, I have three thousand odd, and, and and they are they are odd, but mm-hmm. I have three thousand odd friends. Your Facebook uh, cuts you off at five thousand, so you so better hurry. Another, <laughs> another two thousand come in. I, I'm stuck. Um, on the other hand, Facebook will steal all your information and sell it to other people. So maybe don't. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, and all and my books are on Amazon. Uh, yeah. Although, although you can, you can, if you're in the United States, you can order it directly from me and get an autographed copy. There you go, Steve. Which, it is- in, which in some markets uh, increases value and in others decreases value. <laughs> Fair enough. Steve, it has been an epic, epic interview and, and conversation, it's my been friend. Great. Thank you so much for, for dropping some knowledge bombs on the, uh, on the tribe today. And has anybody ever told you that you remind me of Lynn Manuel Miranda? No, that's the first one. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. But I've not. I, I've never once gotten Lynn Manuel. If if you if you spoken Cockney a little bit, I think I was watching <laughs> Mary Poppins Returns. I listen. I'm a very I'm a big fan of Hamilton. So I, I, I okay. take that I take that with a great uh, great compliment. Thank you, sir. A pleasure talking to you, sir. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey and don't forget to subscribe.